But we come this morning with uh, Nehemiah chapter 13 with, with a little twist. I heard about a, a young mother who, uh, who was having a, a really bad day. Her phone rang and, and this pleasant voice on the other end said, How are you, sweetheart? What kind of day are you having? Oh, mother, the woman said, I'm having such a bad day. The baby won't eat. The washing machine is broken. The house is a mess. I haven't had a chance to go grocery shopping. And, and tonight we're having two couples come over for dinner. The mother was overwhelmed with compassion. Oh, honey, she said, sit down, relax, close your eyes. I'll be over in a half hour. I'll, you can go shopping. I'll clean the house, cook your dinner, and I'll feed the baby, and, and I'll call the repairman to fix the washing machine. Now stop crying. I'll do everything. In fact, I'll even call John at the office and ask him to come home and help you. John, the housewife said, who's John? Why, John, your husband, isn't this 555-1265? Five, 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 five? No, it's 11264. Oh, said the friendly voice, I must have the wrong number. There was a long pause and the helpless woman asked, does this mean you're not coming over? <clears throat> There's times in life that we can just be overwhelmed. That, that, that it can be difficult, it can be challenging and and we can get to a point where we're maybe desperate and willing to, to take help from anyone who, who comes along. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 13 here. God's people become desperate. As I stated, we're coming to the end of this series that we've entitled, Unleash the Leader Within You. And I, I truly pray that there's something that through this series that it just impacted how you choose to live. Wherever you are, whether that's that desperate case or, or God just blessing you and just doing something, that, that there's just something that has stirred that helps you to know how not only to live for God, but hopefully how to lead for God. You see, Nehemiah, we know we've stated uh, several times, was was appointed governor of, of uh, Judah. He, he served for 12 years. We know this because in chapter 1, verse 1, he says that it was the 20th year that he was with the king. And in Nehemiah 13, verse 6, it says in this 32nd year of uh, Exerchus the, the king. And so we know that he had served for 12 years there. We know that chapters 8 through 12 that we looked at tell us uh, uh, after the wall is built about gathering of God's people. And they came to, to hear the first time in a long time God's word opened up and, and brought before them. And we see that uh, towards the end of chapter 12 there that the people made vows to God, commitments to follow him. And then last week we looked at that they had this great celebration that, that God's word and being together just causes this, this attitude of worship and celebration that, that should lead us to. God's people, the first 12 chapters, wanted to hear God's word. They wanted to follow him. They wanted to obey him. And so we see that they made four vows or four commitments. The first one was to follow God's word, his law. The next one was that they would not intermarry with nations around them. The third one was they promised to continue to keep the Sabbath. And the fourth one was that they were committed to faithfully tithe so God's leaders could serve in the temple. Life's good, the first 12 chapters. They were on this mountaintop, if you will. And then we turn to chapter 13. And for the first time, it all comes crashing down. You see, chapter 13, we see here that Nehemiah is excited about returning to Jerusalem. But he was coming in to a rude awakening. He comes back, in fact, to find, if you will, sin's trinity. Neglect, compromise, and disobedience. Have you ever been there in your own walk of, 
of you're on this spiritual high, you're on this mountaintop experience. Maybe that even can be not just spiritually with God, but maybe financially you're doing great. Maybe there's relationally things are just awesome in your family, in your marriage, with your kids. Or maybe it is spiritually and it just seems like we blink and life comes tumbling down. How did that happen? Well, we know if we look back, it wasn't just blinking. There's steps that we took that made that happen. And it's usually because, if you will, sin's trinity. Neglect, compromise, and disobedience. And usually when we get to that point, we, we tend to want to blame God. God, why did you? God, what? When in all reality, it's our steps and what we did. Let's look at how this plays out in Nehemiah chapter 12. If you want to follow along in a pew Bible, it's on page 703. And the first thing we see is that innocent decisions can become detrimental. Nehemiah 13, verse 1. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people, and there was found written that no Amorite or Moabite should ever be admitted into the assembly of God because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, uh, they excluded from Israel all who were foreign descent. Now let me stop there. It says that on that day, the book of Moses, most likely this actually took place at the end of chapter 12. On that day of what we're going to hear next, this is what happened. And again, he, Nehemiah brought the word of God and the people responded to it like we saw before in chapters uh, 8 to 12. And we know this in verse 4, it says, before this, and so before what just took place, um, the priest had been put in charge of the uh, storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. And he had provided him with a large room formerly used to store the grain and offerings and incense and temple articles. So also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil uh, prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers as well as the contributions for the priest. While all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. Okay? He had left. For the 32nd year of uh, Exorzius, uh, the king of Babylon, I returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil things that Elizab had done in providing to buy a room of the courts of the house of God. I entitled this, if you will, Innocent Decisions Can Become Detrimental. But I want you to think about the names that we, we just looked at there. Uh, those innocent decisions can become detrimental. We've done that. We've all been there. But I'm not so sure this and some of ours, if not most of ours, are not innocent decisions, but quite honestly, dumb decisions we choose to make. Notice who the person was here that was provided a room in the temple in the house of God. Tobiah. Where do we know that name from? If you turn back to Nehemiah 2.19, it said Tobiah, the Amorite official, heard about it with some other officials, and they mocked and ridiculed what Nehemiah was about to do. Nehemiah in chapter 2, if you remember, went to go look at the, the, the land and what was going on, and these guys started mocking him right away. We see then in, in chapter 2, I'm sorry, in chapter 4, that it says also they began to, to stir up trouble against the, 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 uh, God's people who had started building. This is someone who is causing problems with God's people on this project, building the wall. And what does he do? Get a room in God's temple. The leadership puts someone in charge of temple who is against this from the very beginning. Elijah's relationship with Tobiah had apparently impacted his leadership and Israel's commitment to what God was doing. The Israelites had stopped tithing to support the temple and the work of God. How do we know this? Because the storehouse was empty. <laughs> there was nothing in it. 
the grain offerings and all the things is, is stood empty. And, and so the priest thought, well, let's rent it out, if you will, to someone else. And so Tobiah literally brings his junk into the storehouse. <coughs> Maybe his, he was rationalizing his decision, thinking that he could replace some of the financial losses with getting this income back in. Maybe what started out was good intentions to help this lagging financial situation in the temple ended up defiling it. This is a way that compromise works. What seems to be an innocent or a dumb decision can have huge, great implications in our life. Maybe some of us started off strong financially, relationally, spiritually. We had great potential. We had great passion and great purpose and plans. It can change in an instant because of decisions we make. It can drop our guard in regards to our marriage, in regards to our careers and our parenting, our finances, and yes, in our relationship with Christ. And whenever we compromise what God has clearly stated for us to follow, we will reap consequences. You see, innocent decisions can become detrimental and can have great consequences. As it grows not only in our own life personally, but impacts those relationships, impacts any and every area of our life, especially as we lose focus of who God is and what He wants to do in and through us. And we see here, just in this one chapter, some important themes that were stated throughout Scripture that caused them to fall. Verse 12, he says, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and all the Levites and musicians responsible for service had gone back to their own fields. So the priests were not getting what they needed from the people, and so they left the temple. So I rebuked the officials and said to them, Why is the house of God neglected? When I called them together and stationed them at their post, all Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms. The first biggie that we see here, that we see throughout Scripture, both Old Testament and New Testament, as they began to compromise, was a disobedience and tithing of giving back to God. Why is that such a big deal? Actually, Jesus made it clear in the New Testament, obviously, where he said, where your treasure is, there is what? Your heart. Where your treasure is, that, that's going to reveal who you really are, where your heart, where your priority, where your commitment is. Throughout Scripture, we're encouraged to give the, the best, the first fruit, if you will, of our resources. Why? As an expression of gratitude of God, realizing all we have is from Him and because of Him and for Him. The practice of tithing provides a, a regular reminder of our dependence on a God who cares so much about every part of our life. In good times, tithing helps us to remember that God is the source of those blessings. But even in those difficult times, tithing should motivate us to remember God is faithful. And it enables us to demonstrate our trust in Him to provide even when it's hard to do. And then we see this other spiritual biggie. Verse 17, I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this wicked thing you are doing desecrating the Sabbath? Now we don't talk a lot about the Sabbath and but Sabbath keeping is one of God's most fundamental passions for his children. Nehemiah thought Sabbath keeping was so important. We see here that he actually paid guards to guard the gate so others could not come in during the Sabbath. Now, obviously, we don't live under the Old Testament law, but the principle of the Sabbath rests and runs throughout Scripture. 
Genesis 1, obviously we know where it says God rested on the seventh day. But the principle of resting is not meant to be a burden, but a blessing for us. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for a man, not man for the Sabbath. God intended it, intends for it to be our time to just chill, to recognize Him, to worship Him. This is a, a busy time of the year as fall kicks off, kids get back to school, we're looking to, to get ready for what's ahead of us. And it is absolutely essential for us to look at our calendar right now. It is full of being busy. You see, you may have to be serious enough that you're willing to sacrifice maybe some career choices. Maybe even lose some money. You may have to be serious enough to fight your time for worship and your time with your family. Because that's actually the next biggie that he talks about here. The family and marriage. Nehemiah 13 verse 23. Moreover in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, <coughs> Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke of the language. What we're seeing here is that they were repeatedly told, Do not intermarry. <coughs> Excuse me. Why? <clears throat> because it affects not only you, but the culture around you and your children. Every now and then, if you, you read here, uh, it says, uh, because he was so upset with them, I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. Now, there's a lot of things you could say about what I've done, and maybe I stepped on your toes, but I know that I've never beat anybody up here. Okay, I've not once pulled anybody's hair and dragged them out. Okay? He was upset here. Why? Because he understands how vital, how important family is. How important marriage is. Remember, Malachi is written at this same time. This is towards the end of the Old Testament, before the silent years of the New Testament. And Malachi is there where he says, I hate divorce. Why? Because of family is so important what God can and will do through his people is huge if we're not corrupted by the world around us there's a book that was written entitled before you say I don't <clears throat> I happen to know the author and and uh, in that it's, it, it talks about uh, research that I had seen that anytime a nation falls it is because of the downfall of the family and marriage. This is a biggie because God knows how vital it is for us to protect our family. And it's not just marriage, though. He's talking about who you associate with. Who are you spending time with? That's why, again, not to overemphasize, but to overemphasize growth groups. Man, to get into a small group of people who are like-minded that are going to encourage you and think and, and get you to, to, to truly understand how much we need one another. Because the people we spend time with will influence us. Young people, teenagers, understand that as you go back to school. The people you spend time with will influence you. You have to decide what you're going to do with that. My friends, we must know, we must remember what God has done in our life. And when we remember what He has done, we will understand that He has healed us, He has cleansed us, He has empowered us from the inside out. And that's how Nehemiah ends all of this. Remember. Nehemiah 13, verse 30. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties each to their own task. I also made provisions for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, my God. 
And we've seen this actually several times throughout this where Nehemiah says, God, remember what's taken. This is not self-serving on his behalf. He wants God to, to know, God, you know my heart. Remember, I truly want to do your will. I, I, I want you to know my intentions are pure. Nehemiah, as he's done already, brings them back to God, to his word, because he knows God's love will take care of our sins. And we, when we know that God's love has taken care of us and our sins, even when we fall away, then, and especially then when we know the depth of his love, then we can only show that same kind of love for others, even when they sin against us. That's why I put the memory verse here out of 1 Peter 4. I just love this scripture. Most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. Why? For love covers a multitude of sins. Remember. We see that word throughout God's word. Remember. Isaiah 46, 9, remember the things I have done in the past. Why? For I alone am God. There is none like me. John 14, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, will teach you everything and will cause you to what? Remember what I told you. Revelations 2, 5, so remember where you were before you fell. Change your hearts and do what you did at first. Think about that. Why would God continually say, remember where you were? Remember what I've done? Because our nature is to go back and do what we did before. To go back and allow the world, the influence of the world as it did with Nehemiah, with the people in Nehemiah 13 here. Our old flesh wants to creep back in and he says, remember, you have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer you who live, but Christ who lives in you. Live by faith. That's why Christ was crucified. That's why we do this in remembrance of him. 1 Corinthians 11. For I passed on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On that night he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took some bread, gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which was given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My friends, that's why we remember. That's why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Remember what Christ has done and what he will continue to do in and through you. This morning, if you need to remember that truth that the old is gone, the new has come, stand on that. This morning, if you need to remember that wherever you are now, in Christ you are free. That His blood has paid for your sins, past, present, and future. Do this in remembrance of who He is and who He made you to be. As our servers